Again, thank you for joining us today. And now I'd like to welcome Mark Manning, Senior Director. Mark, bring that mouse up with you when you come to. Senior Director, Vehicle Engineering and Acquisition at Los Angeles County Metropolitan Transit Authority. Mark is responsible for engineering support and acquisition for LA Metro's 2400 bus fleet. His team is also tasked with developing the roadmap for 100% zero emission buses by 2030. Prior to LA Metro, Mark worked at Chicago Transit Authority for four years, where he managed the electric bus program, acquisition of new buses, and engineering support for more than 1,800 buses. Before his public transit experience, he worked in product development for Cummins Incorporated. Please welcome Mark. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, you know, just uh, I might say the word y'all. I'm from Mississippi, so just in case you're not familiar with that word. Um, I've actually had the pleasure to work with King County since I was at Chicago Transit. You know, I worked with a lot of people from King County on the app to zero emission bus standards. Um, in addition, I really immensely appreciate the information sharing that King County did, especially we had piggyback orders at Chicago Transit where we had bought some of the hybrid buses from King County. So it was very invaluable to share information. So I just want to say I appreciate the staff that I've worked with here, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I love coffee, too, so that's always a great thing. So um, I'll go into this presentation. So I'm going to go ahead. As you heard, we're, we've got a very ambitious task to go 2030, 100% um, uh, by 2030, which is uh, a lot of planning, and we're going to have to figure out how to value engineer, right, so we uh, save taxpayer money. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our system just so you have an idea of what our system looks like. Um, I'm going to talk about our current electric bus orders and then our future plans, what we're trying to do. As you can see, this nice little graphic on the right is our orange line, is what our orange line should look like. We're still in design stages, um, but this is from New Flyer on their bid. So you can see the orange line bus, it's charging at a BRT. So we've, we've focused on BRT for our first electric rollout at LA Metro. So here's our system overview. Yet again, lots of, lots of words, things like that. So we got 2,430 2, buses, technically. So we have 387 60 foot buses, and then we got 638 45 foot buses, and then we got 1,350 40 foot, and then we have even 32 foot. So we got a wide range of buses that we've got to figure out how to electrify, right? Um, we have three divisions that are contracted, so we, we outsource those to private contractors like First Transit, things like that. Um, and there's 162 buses needed for that. And so that also creates some concern, right, is that you need to make sure you give them a vehicle that works for those contracted services. Um, in addition, we also have three subfleets, which, you know, basically what happens is all red buses go on rapid lines, all poppy buses go on local rides, and then we have silver colored buses that go on our express, which is our BRT. So if you think about it, we've got to be very cognizant from the maintenance standpoint not to create even more subfleets for electric buses. And if we do, we've got to make sure we figure out how to manage it to where operators can understand it, maintenance can understand it, et cetera. So that's the, I mean, that's the big thing I think we all have to realize is that subfleets, you know, maintenance operationally, you have to figure out how to handle those. So here, I'm going to show two different layouts that we have at divisions. A little bit of an eye chart, but you'll get the idea. So with, um, with our particular divisions, we have two different types of parking. This is called, we call it the herringbone uh, for this one right here. So if you think about it, every bus has its own specific parking space, right? From an operational maintenance standpoint, this is great. Every bus, know, you know where it's parked, all that stuff. But it's low parking density, right? As we go to bigger, uh, you know, electric buses, if they're not one-to-one, -one, we might even have to make that a higher density garage to maintain the operational needs we have. We may need to increase the fleet size there and do nose to tail. Then our next kind of division is a traditional nose to tail kind of operation, right? Every bus is parked as close as possible. You know, and, and the aspect of this is this makes depot charging via plug-in, uh, you know, a real estate concern, right? It's not like we can go buy more real estate, right? We're pretty much landlocked in wherever we're at. So, so this is one thing, and this is for our silver line. This previous one's actually our orange line for our BRT. So you get a sense of we have two different divisions we're tackling right now, so we have to figure out how it works. So this is what our, you know, just the, the system overview um, of what our routes look like. So we have 398 million riders a year last year. 
Um, 285 million of that is in our bus. Um, you know, we have 105 miles of service, and LA, LA County is a big, massive, you know, transit, uh, transit area to serve, right? So on this map on the right, that's the rail lines, but you also see that we have the orange line at the top left, that's the BRT, and then in there you'll see kind of a silver line in there, which is the silver line BRT, okay? Um, this, is, uh, this is one of the things that I, you know, when, you know, I've only been at LA Metro for three or four months, but the first thing I wanted to do was get a lay of what our vehicles are running at, right? Um, Y'all mentioned 70% at, you know, is, will attain all your uh, vehicle blocks for 140 miles. So that's what I'm trying to look at too. That's like, I think the key piece to learning anything about your electric bus is what do you need to achieve? And I think you also need to understand what is it gonna cost for me to achieve it, right? So if you look at this, for me to do an 80% cumulative for all my vehicle blocks, and if you're not familiar with vehicle blocks, it's when a bus goes out of a garage and comes back, that's how many miles it accumulates in that time frame. So for us, you know, if I did 80%, you know, that's uh, 150 miles. For today's cost, and this is per a new uh, Bloomberg report, it's $313 million for me to make those battery electric for today's cost. In the future, that, you know, in 2030, the prediction is that's $105 million, right? So if you think about it, us trying to transition early, we know we're going to pay a little bit more for the battery. It, you know, it's a fact of life. Fortunately, if we can do battery storage, you know, after those secondary life uh, repurposing, uh, that may make it to where that's even more attractive. The other thing I want to also point out, let's just say we look at 2030. To go from 80% to 100%, so if I try to get a bus that's 350 miles, which, to be frankly honest, is not theoretically possible with current battery chem uh, chemistry, it's $145 million for me to get that last 20 does, I don't, does that make sense? We, we're going to have to figure it out. It may make more sense. Maybe it's you pay that $145 million for extra buses, maybe for real estate, maybe for in-route charging, right? You, you just got to figure out where does it make sense. And so that's the one thing that I would say everyone needs to realize what makes sense because this is a value engineering approach, and we're all going to have to figure out what's the best fit and I don't think any of us you know with our own money would want to spend an extra 145 million if we can figure out other ways to piece things together with in route charging etc I think it's going to be we're going to have to re rethink how we do a business I mean that's really what it boils down to so this is the things that I'm looking at to figure out how to achieve vehicle blocks right we got to figure out how to reduce vehicle weight you know if you think about it reduction of vehicle weight means I can put more batteries on the bus I can also with that you get operational benefits for you know better uh, uh, energy uh, consumption improve operating efficiency and then utilize in route charging in route charge is the only way you're going to get that 350 mile vehicle block right now this is just a uh, you know quick you know back of the hand calculation if you're thinking about electric buses you can't plan for what it is every, like an average of every day. You have to plan for the energy consumption on the worst day with the worst uh, operational efficiency. So for us, when we ran our bus, our first electric buses, it was 3.5. It was our worst day, you know, worst time of the year. That, if you want, and everyone wants their bus to come back to the division or garage um, and not have to call in for a road call or a new bus. So you have to plan for worst case, right? And that's, the, that's a totally different mentality than we have now, right? So for every 50 pounds, with that 3.5, we can now add, you know, roughly one mile of range. So we really need to figure out, you know, much like they do with, you know, racing cars, right? We need to figure out how lightweight the bus so we can add more batteries, right? So here is what I've done just to kind of get me a, a good lay of the land. What is possible with current battery chemistry right now? So if you look at it on that previous chart, uh, Proterra advertises 160 as their battery density, which is equivalent to 70%. So we could do that now. But as you see, uh, advanced lithium ion technology, you have to get about, that's about 300. Well, if you look at 300, right, past 225, you actually can't get it with current technology. We have to figure out if solid state will ever work, you know, aluminum air, you know, so that's the one thing that we also have to recognize is we've got a plan based off the current chemistry that we're aware of, right? We don't know what's going to happen in five, ten years. We may, if we can get the solid state that's better energy density, then 
that's better for us. But for us, at, you know, since we've got the very aggressive time frames, we got to know what we're planning with the chemistry we got now, right? And I think this is where it comes to, I think you, you need to take everything piece by piece, figure out which, you know, what your high vehicle blocks are, which ones you can take out. I call it the low-hanging fruit. You got to figure out which ones you can easily electrify. So New Flyer had a presentation for us, and this is how they kind of equivalented um, a bus and how much battery you, uh, weight you have for batteries. So you have about 7,000 pounds per their calculation, right? So that's how I did the math before. And the other thing that we've got that's unique, well, we have a curb weight limitation for our axles now. So by 2022, we're not allowed to go over 22,000 pounds, and that's the rear axle typically. Um, and so we're at the limitation. Not only can we not put it on because obviously you want to get passengers on the vehicle, but we're also limited because now we have a weight limitation that's been regulated in, the, in California that prevents a lot of batteries on the bus. So we've got a move, like, so we've get, we're getting hard fixed targets that we can't, um, we can't violate. And so I'm going to show some of the things that we're looking at to reduce battery weight. Well, one, if you know, with opportunity and route charging, we're going with SA3105-1 at LA Metro. That's because that's what New Flyer's doing. That's what the industry seems to be going towards. But the key part of this is that it saves 185 pounds on the vehicle, right? So if you look back the previous my, uh, math, that's three to four miles, right? And you, these will start adding up really quickly once you look at all the different things you can do. Passenger seating, right? If you go from, and this is from USSC, if you go from a, uh, an airy seat to a Gemini, it's about 20 pounds per two seats. So if you think about on a 60-foot bus, that's, that's th almost th 400 pounds, Right, so you're getting another eight miles. So you got it. This is a really a piece by piece thing, and I think all of us. And if you think about it, every mile is about seven hundred, eight hundred dollars that you're saving on. Is is roughly that's how much battery cost it is, right? And then lighter weight chassis. You know, Proterra's got the composite body. BYD does some kind of aluminum frame in order to help with them, and that's 1.2 tons is what they claim to be the reduction. That's you know like 40 miles of range, right? So we got to push the, the OEMs to reduce, and then we've got to make the right decisions on our specs to spec for the proper weight reduction. Another thing we're looking at, and this is actually something I was looking at when I was at uh, Chicago, was tip-in frame, uh, going to full fixed windows versus the uh, transom windows. You know, not a lot of weight. On a 60-foot bus, it's, you know, 60 pounds, but... Yet again, we've got to figure out every place we can potentially save weight. Operating efficiency. This is the, you know, this is one of the ones that everyone's got to figure out. Antelope Valley in the report for battery state of practice mentioned that they had a four kilowatt hour difference from one operator to the other. I mean, that's significant, right? So uh, one of the things that we can do to improve vehicle duty cycle with HVAC, HVAC is, it's like eight kilowatts per hour of operation or something like that. So if you can increase the speed, you got less HVAC loading across a mileage, right, if you think about it. Um, low, low rolling resistant tires. So, you know, the higher vehicle speed is why BRT can be very advantageous for the energy consumption. Low rolling resistance tires. Um, improve HVAC efficiency. You know, we've got to push HVAC companies to, you know, give us better HVACs. Uh, remove solar loading. You know, uh, one of the things we were looking at in Chicago was window tinting. We already have it in... Uh, in LA Metro, so we don't have to worry about that. Maybe you do a different glazing if tinning is not something your agency wants to do. Um, you know, the rear window might be something you want to remove as well. I mean, it's a, it is solar loading. It does cost heat in the back of the bus, so it's a potential thing that you need to look at. Um, you know, Proterra's uh, announced that their other drivetrains are 20% more efficient. Maybe that's more cost effective than adding 20% more batteries, right? Um, so we've got to make sure we pick you know, things that will work better for us. This is from a Chevy Bolt dash, and I think what we've got to figure out is ways to design on the bus in terms of accelerating and braking, right, to make it to where the operator could not accelerate like he's in NASCAR. And also, like, if he's braking, you know, one of the things they can do is, you know, full braking, you know, you do full regen, and then you start hit, hitting mechanical braking, right? So you get all the regen you possibly can. Well, then I think they're also going to have to do something with operator feedback, just like you do on a, you know, a, a current EV. 
they're going to tell you, hey, you're putting you know, energy in, you're putting energy out. Um, I'm not sure if it's really possible, but some kind of gamification or incentive program for transit operators to make it because, you know, if you're getting a four kilowatt hour per mile difference, your operator is the one that's going to save you the most money potentially, right? So getting an, uh, an efficient operation is your big, is like the big number. And this is kind of another way that I showed that first table, same similar way, right? Is that, you know, if you think about it, um, if I can go from, I can go from 69% of my vehicle blocks at 3.5 miles, but if I can get that to 2.5 kilometers per mile, which is about 40% efficiency, which I believe is also what King County got on their average for um, the buses y'all had. So if you get, think about that, I go from 70% of my vehicle blocks achieved to almost 90, right? That's a big number. And that ends up being about a $40 million savings in 2030 on battery costs, right? So figuring this out will save you a lot of money. And also you don't have to over design the vehicle, et cetera. So this is a key, another key critical call, call. Figure out how to make your operator efficiency better in terms of both the vehicle design and potentially training your operators to you know, operate more efficiently. And then here's the other thing, in route charging. Well, we've got the silver line and orange line. We're now on our silver line. We're able to achieve one vehicle block of 350 miles. How can we do that? In route charging. That saves a fair amount of money if you think about it. I mean, to, if I was to look at 70 to 100 miles, that's about $60,000 of battery cost, right? For the 350, you know, in the future, that's 300,000. That's a $240,000 savings I'm doing on that one bus by doing in route charging. So that's, you know, so it's a very, I'm a v very big proponent of in route charging for helping save operational costs. I think you got to make sure, just like uh, was mentioned, you have to make sure you got your utility on board because it can also be a very expensive operationally. But if you can figure out the utility to make that a more appealing sense, I think it's a very key portion that you can do for in route charging to save battery costs. And then here's our current electric bus orders, right? So we've got on our orange line, we're going to have new flyer and BYD 60 foot buses. And I want you to key in on the fact that the battery capacity is 250 for new flyer and 610 for BYD. I'll, I'll focus on why that's a concern later, right? Um, think about an operator not under, uh, you know, state of charge. What does it mean when you have different battery capacity? Um, right now, for the orange line, we've got commitments to go SAE 3105 for both BYD and New Flyer. So, potentially, if we beat TransLink, uh, we might be the first, at least in North America, but they may be a little ahead of us in terms of having two different OEMs on the same charging network. BYD, also, we are, you know, we're in discussions with them uh, on our charging strategy. It looks like we're going to go towards SA 3105-1 for them, both on the depot and in route. So that will be very interesting. And like I said, for the depot charge, I'll show that a little bit later. But from real estate, it's, I think, the only way we can figure out real estate. And then I've got a little thing on the, you know, the charging types, if you're not familiar with them. You know, um, most people are going with J1772 for the plug-in which is good if you have non-revenue vehicle that potentially could be like a Chevy Bolt, any of those vehicles that have SA 1772, you could potentially use those for charging your non-revenue fleet, which I think is a, a added bonus, right? You could have these and have higher power DC charging and then charge non-revenue fleet. Then your 3105, yet again, this is something that, you know, in Europe, you know, if you look at the op charge, they're showing you can charge a delivery truck, a bus, and things like that. So you might be able to potentially utilize your in route charging, you know, during times you're not using it, sell the energy to UPS, sell the energy to someone else, right? There's a potential. So this is the orange line that we're working on. So we're going to have eight total in route charging stations. We're right now doing the infrastructure work. And I would say the infrastructure work, you know, it's, a, it's, not, as, it's not as easy right now, right? Because the the standards, the charging equipment's not standard. There's no standard footprint or how you design it. So we're working a lot with, you know, Siemens on this charging system. And I think that's really where we need, like, a footprint design guide so all of us transit agencies can design things quicker. So we got 40, 60-foot buses, 2.9 million miles annually, um, and then 7.4 million riders a year. Yet again, uh, and here's the thing, the trenching just to put in depot charging is costing us $2 million. And we're, we should be finished with that at the end of September. 
or you know, September time, that will be 10 depot chargers. So that's a fair amount of money for 10 chargers. Um, these will be 150 kilowatt chargers that we'll use um, as well. Um, it's kind of an eye chart on this, but you'll get an idea that the top part of this, this was the one that I was showing that was the herringbone style. We're going to have 10 charger locations up at the top of that for parking the vehicles. Um, since this is in route charging in theory, right, you do most of your charging outside, you know, in the street. And then those are really used to do top up charging before the bus goes out. And then that's just the shape of what our orange line looks like. Actually, the buses, some buses will go A to B, some buses will go B to C. So that's the reason we have charging at the various locations. All of them don't go A to C. So there's basically two different kind of vehicle patterns that are in that particular BRT line. And this is our silver line, 4.4 uh, million riders in 2017, 2.5 million miles annually. And the key thing is we had 45 foot buses on this one. We're actually upping the amount of buses because we're going to 40 foot. So we have the same amount of passengers seats per headway right so um, so that's what we're looking at we're looking at the design infrastructure work right now uh, the actual the one that's the little more challenging one is the El Monte station it's actually on the top of a parking deck so we're gonna have to figure out how do you put uh, charging stations at the top of a parking deck so that'll be a new thing for us to figure out and to be honest it's something we're gonna have to figure out with some of our divisions that are actually two level parking so we'll have to figure it out we're we'll just doing it earlier than we planned um, and then again, I, you know, I'm a very big proponent of the, um, this you know, utilizing your in-route charging overhead so you don't have to deal with plugs, plug management, cord management, and things like that. Um, right now, there's one with um, the Panagraph up from the vehicle in the, the Netherlands uh, from a company called Heliox, and I think they're working with VDL. And then Proterra, about, well, it was like two weeks ago, they announced their charging station for SA3105. We're using, you know, canopies. Uh, and using um, solar panels on top, which is good for us, is that right now all of our garages are outdoor. Well, if you think about it, adding a canopy over top, that'll help with cooling loads um, when we're pulling out. In addition, you know, we'll get solar panel and we, we buy air real estate for that. So it's a very intriguing uh, uh, concept. And this is what our silver line looks like right now. You know, we got A to B, B to C as well. Um, we're mostly looking at charging at El Monte and Harbor Gateway because C is actually on street, which is a, a whole different issue. And then this is the one thing that, as I mentioned, we have a mixed fleet. On the orange line and the silver line, if I have operators going between divisions, or if I have them on this orange line, one day they could have a BYD bus that's 610 kilowatt, uh, kilowatt hours, and then the next, the next day they could be driving a new flyer bus at 250. I don't understand what state of charge means at that point, like how we expect them to understand it, right? Um, right now, uh, like most of the bus OEMs, uh, Proterra actually does something similar to Tesla, but it's state of charge. It's a percentage. What does that mean? It really means nothing. And, it, and if, if you think about it, one vehicle block, right, maybe 20 miles, well, you could probably send that bu bus out at 50% state of charge, and it comes back at 20%, and you're fine. But for another vehicle block that is 100 miles, it needs to be at 100%. So this is what you need to also look at in terms of smart charging. Not every bus needs to be topped off, right? So this is what we've, uh, one of the conundrums we have to figure out is how do we communicate to the operator what the range of a vehicle is and if it can, it can accomplish its mission, right? Um, I really like the bolt on the, on the left. It actually has a mileage, a max and a min, and then it tells you what you're looking like, right? What we've figured out both when I was at Chicago and LA is most operators, mileage is not something they think about. It's, it's seat time. I've got an eight-hour shift. I've got a four-hour shift. I need to make sure that's four hours or whatever, right? So that's what we're looking at. It's more of an operating time. Recently, I've met with Vericity. I think their product is very interesting in the fact that, in my opinion, we've got to have something on the back end that does all these calculations for us, the smart charging, you know, the vehicle data, the charging data, et cetera. Because here's a scenario that I'm thinking about, right? Well, we've got two in-route charging stations. Well, what happens if one goes offline, right? Ideally, you'd want something dynamically that feeds the charger into the cloud and then pushes something to the vehicle saying, hey, you need to charge at this other in-route charging station about two or three minutes longer, right, because the other charging station's blocked. Or if you have an accumulation of char buses at a charger, you could tell them to skip charging, right? So we really need this for dynamics to understand the, I mean, it's a system design that we're working with. 
the bus can't operate without the charger. The charger, you know, if it's, if, if it's full or whatnot, we've got to figure out ways around it. And operationally, it's better if it's dynamic because then the operator can look at the dash and potentially say, okay, I can skip charge or whatnot. We still want to make sure the control center's got that information as well, right, so you can plan. And this also allows for fleet flexibility, right? So my buses that are New Flyer 250 kilowatt hour buses, obviously I got the color issue, right, with the silver, but those could potentially be deployed to a shorter range block. And then you would have something dynamically going into the, the dash saying, okay, well, you've got, you only have, it's, it's only an hour long, but the bus can only go an hour anyways. So you need to be able to communicate that the bus is okay, it's a green, it can make your intended mission. I think that's the key part is this allows for fleet flexibility, which I think is um, one of the things that we're going to have to really look at hard in terms of range. So this is an example of one of the things that Vericity does actually in Europe, is this is an in-route charging. As the bus parts, I guess, this particular terminal right here, everything's green. But as it gets closer to the other terminal, the terminal that I just left gets red, and the terminal it's going to gets green. Whether we like the colors or not, it's a different story. But the point is, it's a visualization that helps the operator kind of understand, yeah, I could leave this charging station, and I'm good to get to the next you know, uh, charging point. And I think that's really what's going to be needed to optimize for schedule, for potential down uh, issues with maintenance. You know, maybe the batteries have some issue where they're not taking full charge. There, it's going to be things like that that we're going to have to figure out the plan to make everything operationally efficient. And then the last thing is our future plans. So we've got a zero emission bus master plan, much like you had at King County. We've got the project management. We're doing industry outreach. We're going to be doing trips to go look at various best practices. We want them to engage to help us negotiate with the utility companies because I think all of us recognize that the utility company having a good rate structure for us is the only way to make this operationally efficient, right, and cost effective. Um, you know, so we're also going to have development, you know, RFPs available, which would be both infrastructure and bus. So we want help on doing that. We're going to try to target, um, potentially, we want to try to target low-hanging fruit ones first, right, so we can get some of the RFPs on the street earlier. Um, because there are certain divisions that internally, right, at LA Metro, we know these are good ones based off vehicle blocks that we currently have. That's the main thing we're doing. If you look on the right, that's our utility map. Um, we actually have two utility companies we have to deal with, uh, well, minimum of two. One's uh, LADWP, which is municipality uh, power company, and then we have Southern Com Edison, or Southern Cal Edison, which is, the, uh, which is a PUC. So we've got public and we've got city, you know, different utility rates. And then we also have little small ones as well, like City of Pasadena, et cetera, that we may have to deal with depending on where we put charging infrastructure. Um, the other interesting part is you go more, you know, solar or more renewable, now our demand rate could shift to PMs, which could make it to where like depot charging may not be as cost effective as in route. So it's, it's kind of an interesting thing. We want more renewables, but then that may shift our peak demand. So that's pretty much everything. Uh, got any questions or comments, et cetera?